Sweet. Hold on, I'm going to turn my camera off and back on. Give me one second. Can you guys hear me all right? Throw in the chat. Tell me if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, my, I turned my video off for just one second, but you guys can hear me okay? Perfect. All right, so we are wrapping up the day. Today was so amazing. We had so many really, really good speakers, workshops. I think some of my favorites, just as a recap, um, the session with uh, Craigslist founder, Craig Newmark, talking about his experience launching a business without taking on any venture capital. Um, really, really good. I loved that session. Also, uh, the session with the Evolved Finance team with Parker, talking about how to manage your business, how to manage your money for your business. So good. And also, Ania Williams joined us earlier. She talked about her crowdfunding campaign, how she structured that, how she got the first money to kind of kick off and launch her business. All of these sessions have been so good. And I know that a lot of you guys have remaining questions, questions about your own business ideas, questions about things that you kind of have brewing. And so I wanted to take a moment before we close out for the day and talk about that and answer any questions that you guys have. So throw your questions into the chat. Um, as you guys know, today is business model and business day. Tomorrow, we're going to start talking about some of the technical stuff a little bit. We're going to kind of ease our way into the tech stuff. So tomorrow, we're talking about you know technical essentials, things you need to know as a non-technical entrepreneur. So if you don't write code, all things you need to know. Then on Wednesday, we're going to be talking a lot more about apps. We're going to have the founder of Bubble um, and a lot of other really cool tools that you guys know come in and do workshops and trainings on specific tools you guys can use to build apps without code. And then on Thursday, we're going to be talking about marketing. So you know all that stuff is coming up, but I want to um, answer any questions that you guys have now. The first question was if we want to recap or look back at the sessions, where do we find the recorded content? So I just want to tell you guys that we're currently loading up all the recording content. It takes a little bit for the recordings to process. So bear with us. They're coming. Let me show you exactly where to find them, though, when they are ready. We also will send you an email. But in case you don't get that email, I want to show you where they will be. So give me one second. I'm going to actually share my screen and show you. While I'm doing this, throw in any questions that you have. I'm going to be just answering people's questions. And it can be questions about the conference, but also questions mainly about your business and what you're building and things you're trying to figure out and process for the day. Okay. So there are some recordings already available. Some of them are not yet available. And to find them... Let me share my screen. You're going to go to just the um, home page for the conference, and you're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom of all the sessions for the days, and you'll see the replays from um, today. So if the replay is not available yet, so for example, I think a NIA session replay is not available yet because um, there's no place to see the replay when I click it. It's coming. Um, but there are, you got to click view more and scroll all the way down. Um, but there are some sessions where the recording is available and as they're becoming available, for example, here's one where the recording's available. So you'll see it like that. I'm not going to play it because it'll be too much noise, but, um, there are some recordings that are starting to get loaded up and we'll have them all loaded up by this evening and we'll send you an email when they're all ready. Okay. But if you're antsy, you can start seeing them now as they come up. All right. Um, questions. Mark said, how do you determine how much a subscription should be when you don't know? Let me stop sharing my screen for a second, actually. Okay. How do you determine how much a subscription should be when you don't know what your costs are going to be? 
Ooh, this is a really great question. So this is actually something that I break down for my bootcamp students. I wish I had a, a visual to show you. There are different ways to set your pricing. One way to set your pricing is cost-based pricing. So you go, okay, it's going to cost me $20 a user to offer this. So I'm going to charge $50. I'm going to do a markup and charge $50, right? That's one way to set your pricing. It's not the only way. Another way to set your pricing is to go, well, what's the value that I'm offering to my customer? The customer is going to save on average $100 a month using this. So I should charge a minimum that or something around that, right? So there, there's cost-based pricing. There's also other kinds of ways to set your pricing, like value-based pricing, which is what I just mentioned. And there's also competitive pricing. You can go look and see what competitors are charging and charge something you know above or below that. So there are different ways to set your pricing. It does not always have to be pricing based on what your costs are going to be. In fact, with software, you almost should never do cost-based. Here's why. It's very cheap, actually, to launch software compared to other businesses, right? If I want to make an iPhone, it costs some money to make this iPhone. It costs a lot more money than it would cost to make some software. So you actually don't want to go after cost-based um, pricing with software because your costs are going to be really low. You're going to actually underprice what the actual value is to your customer. So you kind of maybe want to look more at competitive based pricing or at value based pricing. Um, Stephen asks, what suggestions do you have in raising capital to fund a not for profit? I actually don't know. I don't have a ton of experience and background with not for profits. Um, I know for for profits what that looks like, but not so much in raising capital for not for profit. So I want to give you answers that I know the answer questions, answer questions. I definitely can give you really good guidance on and I have less information on that. Uh, Joanna says, um, can you talk about your transition from Collecto, which was the first company I ran to AWC? Uh, how did your business model change from Collecto to AWC? Ooh, this is a great question. Actually, no one has ever asked me that question before. It's really good. Um, so let me actually I can mark these as answers as we go. Okay, so, you know, Collecto was the first company that I ever launched. And one of the things, just looking back, that I wish I had seen or knew and wish somebody had kind of broken down for me was how my business model math was going to play out. So we talked a little bit about this earlier this morning. My business model changed from Collecto to AWC in two ways. One, I stopped doing low margin business models. So with Collecto, you know, we did lots of revenue, we did really well, but the company actually got to take away 30% of the transaction, right? So if we sold a piece of artwork that was $1,000 to a customer, we gave, you know, $700 of that to the gallery or to the artist, and we kept, you know, 300 of that. And so we weren't actually making $1,000 on every transaction. We were making less than that. 30% um, is not a bad margin, but it what didn't support the kind of lifestyle that I wanted to live. In other words, with my first company, I built a business that had to be big in order for it to be successful. And I wanted to build a business that could be big and small. And so just, you know, as things were playing out, I did, never meant to launch AWC. It was not intentional, um, but it happened because I was blogging about some things and people were interested in working with me and kind of I took my individual personal coaching business and launched it into something larger. But the big main difference was I went after a different business model and I focused a lot more on businesses going right directly after businesses as opposed to um, just to consumers. And I know a lot of what you guys see is my, the consumer side of my business, but those would be the biggest change. That's the biggest transition. Okay, other questions. Uh, Yolanda asked, Tara, do you have tips on fielding through the business concepts, ideas you're holding in your head and heart? I have a few ideas, but looking for a method to decide what to put my time, energy, and money into um, in a way that they're, you know, so that you can prioritize, test, et cetera. So, you know, I think that if you are going to be, there's a difference between launching a passion project and launching a business, 
right? So I think what you want to do is start to separate which one of these ideas are lucrative businesses and which ones are passion projects. I don't know, Yolanda, if you were in the session, the very first session we did today, this morning, where we did our business model math. So the first thing we did was figure out how much money we need to make, you need to make in order for this to feel worth your time full time, right? So for a lot of people, it's like $100,000, $150,000, $70,000, like something usually around the kind of salary that they want to make. And then I would go through every single one of my business ideas and kind of give, give an estimate of what the pricing would be. This one, I think I can charge, you know, $2,000 a month for. This one's a 99 cent, you know, for it. Go kind of make it your best guess at what you think the market is willing to pay for each of those ideas. And then do the math. Divide those two numbers and see how many customers you need to have in order to hit your lifestyle kind of income goals. I would go after the highest and most lucrative one. I know a lot of people talk about follow the passion, um, but your passion is really tough when you're broke. So you, if you're building a business, if you're building a side project, it's different. If you're building a passion project, it's different. If you're building a business, you want to go after the one of your ideas where you, A, um, are going to get, you know, need to do the least amount of work um, in order to make good money, right? So it's going to be the most lucrative and B, where you have connections in the industry and the space such that marketing will not be completely hard and starting from scratch for you, right? Those are the two, would be the two things I would look at. Okay. Um, Kiara says, in your last session, you um, and the speaker mentioned non-compete agreements. I haven't started the job yet, and I want to start a business within the same industry as my job. I'm mostly on the tech side, whereas my job is in the retail side. To me, this doesn't sound like an issue, but not sure. So, Kira, you just want to read the contracts that they're sending you um, when you start and you know sign on to be an employee, right? So different companies do different things. Some companies say you cannot work on anything on the side. We don't care what it is, right? So you just have to be clear and look at what you're signing. Um, it depends on the company and what they put in their agreements, but make sure you read your paperwork. Cool. Um, okay. Frederick said, I would love to connect with more people, but big marker is odd. Is it just me? Each chat closes when the speaker closes. Um, yeah. So let me show you exactly how to access the full community. I'm going to share my screen again. So we're, um, Frederick is saying he's trying to chat with people inside of each session. So you can do that, but after the session is over, poof, the chat's gone. So let me show you another place you can go to chat. I mean, everybody should be leveraging this and it'll be really useful for you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. It's coming, it's coming. So if you are on the um, conference page, you can click attendees here and you can see the hundreds and hundreds maybe thousands i think in here now of people who are attending this conference and then you can also click on discussion and chat with people here people are talking about different things there's polls there's questions there's all sorts of stuff going on in there so you want to go in here and kind of talk with other people from the conference share notes um ask questions collaborate on things the discussion tab of the kind of home page of the conference is where you should go Okay, other questions. Pertaining to the apps, what type of content do you think would grab uh, the consumer's attention um, to want to pay a monthly subscription for it? Um, I know a lot of apps are free, so I'm wanting to get an idea of what content will get people willing to pay for an app. Lauren, can you tell me more about the exact kind of app that you're trying to build, specifically what problem you're solving for people in your app? That will help me answer your question. And I'm going to come back to that. Um, Daphne said, can you tell us why your first business, Collecto, is on hold while you're not currently running it? Um, it required more work than the money I was making from it. 
And I stumbled upon another business that was far more lucrative and grew that into a mid six figure and plus business. And it didn't make sense for me to juggle two things. We talked about in our last session, right? We, you as a founder, the CEO can only do so many things. Um, and so it didn't make sense for me to do that anymore. Um, and there were other opportunities and I had to, you know, find an opportunity to, you know, put something else in the back burner. Uh, but it's a really good question. Uh... Uh, Kyle says, I hate to say it, that after thinking about my nerd bucket list idea, it sounds more like a passion project rather than a business. Not sure if it will fit in a safer business model. Do you think it's possible to make, uh, take a passion project and turn it into a business? Yes, if you are willing to make some compromises with it. So if you are only willing to uh, execute the original vision that was in your head, then you're stuck. But Kyle, like, I think there's a lot of work. Like, let's do this right now. Give me three examples, Kyle, of nerd uh, bucket list activities someone would need to do. Give me three of them. And I'm going to help you work through and workshop right here, right now, how you can turn this into a business. You may have to take away some things that were part of the original vision in order to turn it into something people are willing to pay for. And you've got to make that decision. I would say one of the big mistakes that I personally made in my first business is people told me over and over again, you should launch this to businesses. You should offer this in a slightly different way, pivot it a little bit, and offer it to businesses. So lots of companies have new employees come and they have to decorate their office. You should help them do that. I was like, I don't want to do that. That's not part of my vision, right? I would have made a lot more money had I done that, right? So there's you kind of get to make decisions and trade-offs. And if it's your passion business, you get to just do whatever it is that you want, but you maybe don't make as much money, and it doesn't really become a business. It's just a passion, and that's okay. It is totally fine to have passion projects. There's nothing wrong with that. Just be clear on what it is that you're doing. Okay. Um, my asked, um, any advice if one should start with a web app or a mobile app? Really great question. Again, we're going to talk about a lot of this stuff um, in tomorrow, the day after. Um, I think in most scenarios, you should launch with a web app. So just to break this down for people who aren't familiar. A web app is uh, if you go open up your phone and you open up a browser, Chrome, Safari, whatever you use, and you type in Facebook.com, you are on a website and you're kind of on their their uh, web app, though. Or if you go to your computer, it's an even better example. You go to your computer and you type in Facebook.com, you're on the web app. You can also go into the app store and download the Facebook app. That's called a native app. Um, or oftentimes we call it a mobile app, right? You same information, you're logging into the same accounts, but they're in different formats. For the most part, people build mobile apps, the native apps, the ones in the app store when they don't need to. So the only scenario where you really need to build a native app is if it's something that people use every day. I know all of you guys have experience where you have downloaded an app and you didn't really use it and so you deleted it or you forgot about it and it's on page 12 of a bunch of apps you have, right? There's so many. In fact, when you look at the apps that people actually keep on their phone, they're very few. So what you're doing by just launching first with a mobile app, a native app in the app store, is you're putting yourself in a far more competitive space. If you compare the number of apps on your phone to the number of websites you go to in a day, you go to more websites than apps, right? So I like to have people build web apps I think it's a better way to go. There may be some exceptions. If you're going to build a better Uber where you're going to be out and about and you need to instantly access location services from your device, maybe it makes sense to have a, uh, a app in the app store where you can access location specific or phone specific features. But for the most part, you don't need that. Um. Cool. Um, Eugen, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Um, supplementing Frederick's com comment, how to get connected to all attendees like via LinkedIn. Um, we can facilitate that. If you guys want to go into the community um, onto the discussion board and say, hey, everyone, post your LinkedIn so we can all kind of connect offline, you can definitely do that. So somebody start that thread and we can all go and comment on it and add our LinkedIn links. That would be awesome. Cool. Frederick was sharing you use balsamic to quickly wireframe things and test them. Yeah, that's right. Um, 
Okay, um, there's also a question about, you mentioned in several instances, hidden apps or invisible apps. Can you explain it again, um, use the benefit, et cetera? So again, we're going to do an entire session. Like, let me show you this. I'm doing an entire session tomorrow, uh, early on in the day on invisible apps, what they are, et cetera. So I won't go into that too much. But literally, if you take a look at what's coming up tomorrow, the first session of the day is why your app first app should be invisible. Um, so you'll be able to check that out. Uh, the benefit high level, you can launch it in, you can have it launched by the end of this week very quick and customers find it very convenient. Those are kind of the benefits. Uh, cool. Um, I was asking, would be great to know how your first business experience helped you build and make the second business bigger, better. Yeah, I, I think that there are things I said already, right? I had a clear idea of what the implications of business models were, which is why I share all this stuff with you guys. I, had, I was clearer on what kind of business model I would and would not pursue. I was less... Um, enamored with the traditional Silicon Valley way of building a business. And I went into my second business knowing that I didn't want to take venture money, um, knowing what the repercussions were of that. I didn't fully like hear the whole story going into my first business. And it seemed much sexier than it was once I actually got into having investors, having a business like that. Um, okay. Kyle's back. Kyle says, um, here are several nerd bucket list examples. One, attending a moving premiere, dressing up as a fictional character, going to San Diego Comic-Con. Cool. Great. Does Comic-Con, the conference, have an app? I'm sure they do. If I were you, I would be figuring out maybe one of those things. I would take one of those bucket list items and go specifically and build something directly for that. Right. You could do a bunch of things. Comic-Con has like a huge raving community. I even see people in here like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Comic-Con, all these different things. Right. There's so many things you could build around that. And there's so many smaller conventions like that. who Maybe Comic-Con does have their own app and their own experience where people can checklist all the different things that they do when they come to the conference. But I'm sure these smaller ones, these smaller organizations don't. And you can go and kind of license it to them and say, hey, Comic-Con has this. You should have something like this too, right? That's taking your same kind of nerd bucket list concept, but putting it in a place where it's lucrative and going to make you thousands of dollars at a time as opposed to just 99 cents for individual consumers. But the key here, I think, would be for you taking one of the things that might be on a list and zooming in on that, on solving a problem in that specific niche area. Uh, cool. Pamela says, did you use this conference to attract customers for your core business? No. Not at all. You know, we planned this business, this conference, and we sat down and thought, well, what can we do to bring the industry together? This whole concept of building apps without code is really relatively new and not a lot of people know about it. So really what we did this for was to get a lot of information to you guys and also to kind of bring the industry together, a lot of different people talking together, et cetera. And actually last year when we kind of came up with this idea, I sat down and thought through what are the community impact things that I want to personally do and that I want our company to do? How do I want to kind of give people access to something at a bigger scale than we've been doing before? And we came up with the idea of this conference. Cool. Okay. I see more questions. So, Joanna said, what are your thoughts on co-founders? Do you need co-founders? I think that having co-founders is really helpful. I don't think you need them. I think you will hear a lot of investors uh, talking about we only uh, give money to companies who have a co-founder, who have a technical co-founder. In my opinion, you know, particularly in my first business where I wasn't um, – where I was raising venture capital, I um, just thought like, that's not the right investor for me, right? That's it. So um, I, I don't have, I think that for me, like I work really well having a really close tight knit team. I've got executives on my team. You guys have seen Dan running around here um, who are just really, really skilled 
who, you know, are amazing. And so I just have a really close kind of executive team. And some of those people came from my previous company and we moved over and kind of they worked on work on apps that code now. So um, I don't have co-founders personally. Um, and I don't think that you need them. I will say this. There is a element of emotional and mental stress that comes with running a company and being the boss that you then don't get to share. So if you don't have co-founders, you better find communities of other entrepreneurs who are founders. So I leverage a lot mastermind groups. We get up every Monday morning and talk about what's going on in our business. And I leverage those communities a lot. If you don't have a co-founder, you need to find other ways to have access to the brain trust of other entrepreneurs and founders. Cool. Okay. Um, other questions? So Lauren, I want to go back to Lauren's question. Her original question was pertaining to apps, what types of content would grab your consumers um, so that they're willing to pay for more. So she said, I'm a wardrobe stylist and wanting to either offer styling service or more so a styling service in the app. Great, Lauren. This is very easy. So I don't know if you heard me earlier say um, build a business that happens to have an app, not an app that happens to have a business. So, Lauren, you are in a phenomenal spot. Here's why. You already have a business. You are already a wardrobe stylist. For you to launch an app to new people doesn't necessarily make sense. For you to use your app and say, you pay me, I don't know what you charge, right? You pay me $100. I'm making this up for me to style some things for you. And when you become a paying customer, you get access to the app. You get to take pictures of things that are in your closet and upload them and I can organize them for you and distribute the work that I do as a wardrobe stylist through the app. Um, And maybe you can charge your customers a little bit more if they do it with or without the app, but you wanna build a business that happens to have an app. So for you specifically, you don't need to be thinking through what kinds of new content do you necessarily need to put in the app. You take your existing business if you need and build it in. Someone was saying you don't need to build an app. You can use Shopify or Tomorrow's Share Tribe. All of those things are apps. So anywhere where you log in, someone can log in with a username and password, that is an app. You don't have to have a mobile app doesn't have to be in the app store, but you could build something that helped you do your business and gave some technology and made it cool and fun and novel for your customers. But you don't need to come up with something totally new that's going to be competing with 99 cent apps in the app store. You could do that, but it would be a lot of work for just 99 cents every time. I think you want to just add a premium tier or add another piece of your experience that already exists and use that to get more customers and leverage. Does that make sense? Hopefully that kind of answers your question. Okay, Um, Jasmine said, what's the best way to build an advisory team for your business to ensure the business concept is well communicated and valued? So Jasmine, I actually think these are kind of different questions, right? The best work that you can do to make sure that your business concept is well communicated and valued is to put it in front of customers. So your advisory team is not going to be your customer. And I would warn all of you guys kind of against um, asking people for their feedback on how your your product is valued who are not the customer. So the way you want to figure out if it's well communicated or valued is you take a hypothesis of how to communicate it and you put it in front of a customer and see how they respond and then make some tweaks and put it in front of another customer and see how they respond. That being said, advisory teams are great. Um, and one of the things I'm actually doing is I made a list recently of all the people that I wanted to develop relationships with. I took, I'm taking the next six months really building relationships with them. And then I'm going to be asking them to join sort of an informal, not a, uh, a financial board, but a informal kind of advisory board for me. So I don't know if there's a best way to do that. Um, but I think more than anything, you rip off the band aid and you call them and ask them. Right. And you put some sort of structure around it. We're going to do a monthly call. We're going to do a quarterly call, et cetera, um, as opposed to just saying, like, hey, just advise me whenever it feel like it. You put some structure around it. It helps a little bit. Okay, other questions.
Anne said, you mentioned earlier this morning that we should sell before building. Can you explain how to do that? Yes. So let's say that I want to create a, let me make something up, um, a app that We'll use this app, this app we're using right now. I want to create an app that helps businesses run online conferences. That's what I want to create. So I'm not going to go build it first. I'm going to go find some companies, go look on LinkedIn, look on Twitter even. I can go look on hashtags because lots of conferences have hashtags for their conference. So I'm going to go look at all on Twitter, all the conferences I can find or any posts that have hashtag con or hashtag live is part of it. And I'm going to make a list of a bunch of different companies that have recently had conferences. And then I'm going to go on LinkedIn and I'm going to find their email addresses and I'm going to send them an email and say, hey, my name's Tara and I'm the CEO of Conference App. And again, this is a lot of like fake it till you make it, right? See, because it's going to feel weird to say that when you haven't built anything yet. One of the things that we do is we make custom apps for people like yourself to broadcast their conferences online. Wanted to know if this is something you were interested in and doing for your next upcoming conference, right? So then so I get some responses back. People are like, yeah, I'm interested. Let's talk about this. So I get on some phone calls. I'm hearing about what they need. Oh, well, what we really need is, okay, we need people to be able to chat on the left side of the of the conversation so that when the person's presenting, people can ask questions and we need people to be able to record their sessions and make them available afterwards, et cetera. So you're learning all the things that they need. And then what you say is, okay, great. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put together a proposal of what it would look like for me to custom build something like this for you. So by the way, a lot of what you do when you sell before you build, I talked about this in the last session and a lot of others, if your first sell is going to be probably a custom build, particularly if you're doing it for businesses, right? It's going to be a custom build. And then you can use that custom build to sell to other people afterwards. But you're going to say, okay, great. Um, let me put together a proposal of what it would look like for us to work together. And then you go send them the proposal. And as soon as they pay, you can do it however you want, right? They can pay when the app's delivered. They can pay, you know, a small percentage up front and then the rest when the app's delivered, whatever it might be. They can pay monthly starting now. They can pay monthly starting later. Well, however you want to structure it, you've got to get either money in the bank or a letter of intent signed. A letter of intent is a document from a business saying, yes, when this is ready, when you build this, we will buy it, right? So you go get your letter of intent or you go get your first customer. That's true for consumer or business to business. And then as soon as you got it, you go build what they want. So that's what selling before you build looks like. And it makes sure that you don't go, that you're building the right thing and that you don't go building the conference app that has, XYZ feature when no one even cares about XYZ feature. All they care about is the chat on the side and the ability to record. Does that answer your question, Anne? Um, Lauren said, can you talk about how effective starting a blog can be towards hacking traction and growth for your startup? What platform or CMS did you use to start your blog? So when I first started blogging, I blogged on Tumblr. No one was reading. I think that people maybe overestimate um, how much visibility you're going to get to your blog early on. Early on, it's going to be your mama and your friends right? <laughs> reading your blog. And so I think that um, blogs can be effective. For me, it was really effective. But I think more than anything, in my first year blogging, blogging was effective because it gave me as a CEO a place to write everything down. It wasn't like the first year, it wasn't a big marketing strategy because no one knew who I was and no one cared. Um, I think there's some other things you can do to that are specifically directed at getting traction. For example, doing a guest blog post, a blog post on someone else's site that has a large audience will get you a lot more traction than just starting your own blog from scratch because nobody's watching. So when you first start, your blog is really for you, and then it later kind of becomes for other people. Okay. Uh... Cool. Uh, I'm just reading you guys' answers. So uh, Kyle is talking about kind of his original idea for gamification. Um, and I totally get that. I'm super clear on that. Um, 
Pamela was sharing an idea for Lauren, and create a directory for stylists. Great. That works really well if the stylists are willing to pay you to be in the directory. Right. Um, so as long as you can monetize it. Amazing. Um, cool. Yeah. Paul was saying the best advice is from people who are willing to pay for your offering. Yeah. Guys, if you are getting advice from people who are not willing to pay for your offering, they will pull you every which way that maybe is and maybe is not relevant. So be careful with that. Cool. Cool. Yeah, guest blogging is where you find someone following of their blog and you ask to write a post on their blog. Cool. Um, talk about your boot camp a bit and the deliverables after students finish. I'll talk about it really quickly. Um, but if you want to know more about the coaching programs that I have and the apps that code does, I'm going to put in here an email for you guys uh, to contact. Um, and I recommend if you're interested in working with the Absolute Code team and getting your company launched um, to contact Blake, who runs admissions for Absolute Code, and he can tell you a lot more. But just high level, um, we run a program called Absolute Code Bootcamp. It's a 12 week coaching program. The coaching happens in two different formats. One, you're getting a ton of online lessons, sort of like we're doing today, right? Um, and then the other is video chat. So we all are um, kind of different from here where like I'm talking to you, you can see me, but I can't see you. It's it's equal. So we can all see each other. Um, and there are classes every week. And then also this thing called launch weekend, which is a full 20 hours of getting your whole app plan, strategy, work, all that stuff done. So um, it's really awesome. The deliverable, the whole program is focused on getting you paying customers. Right. Um, and that's what we see. So a lot of folks graduate. Um, we have folks who've licensed their app to Coca-Cola. who are making big contracts, people who've licensed their app to entire school districts. We really do focus in on companies who are business to business. So they're selling to one of their business. Maybe they didn't. Their idea wasn't originally a business to business idea, but they found a way to kind of uh, have a business to business arm that they're going to focus on for the boot camp or people who are doing consumer products who um, have a high willingness to pay. So they're not thinking about 99 cent apps or thinking about something that people are gonna pay a lot of money for. Um, and we work directly with them through our coaching framework, all that good stuff. It's a really awesome program. So if you wanna know more about that, um, you can go to apps.code.com and check it out. Um, if you want to apply to the program, it's apps.code.com slash apply. Um, and you can also email Blake. Cool, we have some student, current students who are in boot camp as well who are here. Sweet, okay, so we're gonna wrap up here. We have more sessions coming up tomorrow. Um, some of the sessions I'm really excited about. Um, we're gonna kick off with why your first app, let me actually show you this really quickly. Why your first app should be invisible. We're gonna talk more, if everybody's asking about invisible apps, we're gonna talk more about this. Um, we're gonna have another CEO war story session with David Chen, who's the CEO of Strikingly. He built a uh, app and website that, and he is not a technical entrepreneur himself. He doesn't write code himself. So he's gonna talk about how he built his tech startup as a non-technical entrepreneur. Xander Pollock, really great uh, designer, phenomenal designer. He actually launched a company, sold it to Google, and then um, became a, a designer for the Google team. And he worked on, I don't know if you guys have seen that new Inbox by Gmail product, not the regular Gmail, but the new one, the Swipey, the Inbox by Gmail product. He helped design that. So he's going to talk to us about how to design our app experiences. Um, what else? And then also we're going to be talking about crazy ways to launch an app. It'll be a panel discussion from people who have built apps without code themselves. And they're going to be sharing exactly how they did that and all that good stuff. So lots of really awesome stuff coming up. And I will see you guys tomorrow for day two. OK, I will talk to you guys soon. Comment in the discussion area so we can chat some more. All right. Bye bye.